Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. We have with us a returning guest, Paul Puey. He's the CEO of Airbits, uh, one of the premier mobile wallets. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Paul. Hey, thanks a lot, Trace. Glad to be back. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about Airbits. What exactly are you doing over there? Well, so a lot of people know Airbits as, like you had mentioned, a mobile wallet for Bitcoin. We've been around for almost a couple of years. And the biggest goal for Airbits was to provide a really familiar user experience that maximized security, but in still a way that allowed the users to control and hold their own keys and have full autonomy and privacy of their data. And what we're now doing is taking that exact same data model, the same thing that we do to encrypt and backup private keys and data inside of the Airbits wallet, and we've just released uh, an SDK, an API, that allows other applications to use that same security model and that same data model for their apps, whether it be other wallets, other crypto applications, blockchain applications, and actually other apps that just need client-side zero-knowledge data security. And we're actually, I was you know, just here at the conference and bumping into a startup that has a great, super simple, easily monetizable idea that needs exactly this because they don't want to touch the user's data. They just want to process it. And so we're excited about the different things we can build with this, and we're getting quite a bit of traction interest in other blockchain apps that don't have key management. Like basically just simply don't manage keys at all. They just leave it to the user. So what exactly is zero knowledge? Uh, this is a phrase that's thrown around a lot in mm -hmm. cryptography. Maybe you could explain what zero knowledge is to our listeners. Yeah, so admittedly, zero knowledge is a bit of a misnomer. There's no such thing as zero knowledge. There's no such thing as zero trust. I think where we throw it around in the cryptographic world is at least the concept that the developers, people that develop the app and provide a service, don't have knowledge of the data and the, and the actions being done by the users. So in our case, the, the knowledge that we don't want to have and we want to keep at zero is knowledge of the user's information, the data, the, definitely the private keys, because private keys are the thing that each individual should control and own themselves. So making sure that the platform doesn't present and doesn't provide access to that information to the app developer, on, to servers, to attackers, that's what we consider as zero knowledge. So we've got cryptography, but we've also got another branch called cryptanalysis. When we're looking at cryptanalysis, like maybe you can help explain a little bit about what cryptanalysis is and how zero knowledge plays in with that. Well, I like to think that crypt. I mean, I, I have not. I'm not in the cryptanalysis space personally, but a lot of cryptographers are basically analyzing the different holes in applications and cryptography as a whole. And so I think the two kind of go hand in hand as far as what we need to do to provide good zero knowledge applications, good zero trust applications. But you know, the study of cryptography is just kind of broad and definitely revisiting the, the tools that we've used in the past and making sure that we're using relevant tools today and that they still apply is an important piece of that study. Yeah, so when we're looking at specific use cases for some of these things, maybe you could give us an example oh, yeah. of, of how people are going to be or... or different User. startups want to actually use Airbits. Like maybe you can give us a specific example of that. So think of pretty much any blockchain application. So there are a few different hackathon projects here at the conference. One of them was a smart contract that enabled a guild to be formed where different members of the guild would vote on where money gets spent, who is the, the director of the guild, and any other aspects of a DOA. Um, and actually, DAO. is this, is now, this the, like a World of Warcraft guild? Um, that they call type it. Of they thing, call or? it guild. In a way, it was it was just an organization. They call okay. it guild because of people of similar interests that maybe work, or uh, maybe a guild is a bad term, but they were using it. And I was overhearing it, so I'm using the word now. But a union would be a better example in today's age. So okay. a union of workers. Now that application is simply it builds and executes smart contracts, sends them to the blockchain, and it allows people to own 
a, a piece of the vote and also the funds that might get distributed through that guild. Now, that application is a local client app that runs on people's devices and actually needs people to own and control keys. Now, the alternative, the, the current implementation of that software is simply, hey, go write down these 12, 24 words. Now, that might work for some people, but for the vast majority of the population, that's not what we're accustomed to. And so enabling people to use regular login credentials that still apply zero-knowledge encryption, backup, and synchronization so that if they lose their device, they can go to another device and easily recover their account and those keys that let them access the, the guild or the, the, the DAO of that organization. Or is, that's effectively what we provide. And there's pretty much every uh, blockchain app that does have a client-side component for an end user is one that could use our application. Now, as another example, one thing that we're really, really excited about for edge security, which is what we've built, is the idea of being able to identify ourselves using public-private key cryptography. One of the challenges with our identity solution today is that when I want to identify myself, I present my ID, my passport, the last three addresses I lived in, and miscellaneous other information. Well, if you combine all that, that's effectively a private key. Now you've given someone else the private key that allows them to more or less imitate you. With public-private key cryptography, we can simply provide people with a public address, prove who we are once with one entity, and then prove by uh, cryptographic signatures that we're the person that, own that, that owns that private key, thereby authenticating with other people without giving up all of that sensitive information. And so encrypting and securing private keys for just everybody enables a huge slew of different applications, starting first with identity management, and then that can enable other apps which rely on those same identities. And from that private key, you can derive other private keys, and then you can secure data. Healthcare records another thing that we're really excited about, being able to enable users to secure their own records for health and then only share them with who they please, as opposed to a central server holding everyone's healthcare records and then playing the gatekeeper model similar to a bank. So how would that actually work, like securing your healthcare records? I mean, are we talking you'd be able to show when you cross cost when you cro- cross customs that you would actually receive particular vaccinations? I mean, how, how is that going to kind of play out? In the very simplest form, it starts with people at least having their healthcare records. And this isn't really a blockchain issue. This is simply an edge security issue, allowing people to hold and control their own healthcare records where only they can see it. The second layer on top of that, which I know a lot of blockchain companies are looking to solve, is the opportunity to then sign those records by appropriate individuals such as the doctors who created them in the first place. And those signatures can be placed on the blockchain along with a hash of those records. So now when I go and take one of uh, a record from one doctor and present it to another, they can verify that it truly was signed by the right individual that actually has the authority to do so. So that's where the blockchain comes in is for signatures. And it could be well, a we prescription come, It could be a whatever. prescription. It could be just simply a record. It's, it could be um, you know, biometric data. All of that, it, it's just that we will store it in a way that only the user can see it until they share it. And the blockchain can store the signatures to prove that they're authentic. And I think the combination of those two are powerful. But it first starts with edge security, meaning users control their own keys, users control their own data. Now, the users are uh, of all varying degrees of skill. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> right? So, I mean, how do you make this easy for users? Got it. That's uh, the- how do you make it foolproof or idiot-proof? Well, nothing in the world is idiot-proof. So we're just going to say, like, if you're really of that far off in the spectrum, well, then Darwin will... <laughs> we'll weed we'll you out exactly. with your healthcare Darwin, records. <laughs> Darwin will weed you out, and, and, and hopefully your mistakes will prevent you from being or able Obama to Obamacare. Exactly. Obamacare will weed you out. <laughs> exactly. But what we do to make things easy, first we ask ourselves, what's familiar to people? What model of data security is familiar with people? Because we're in this transitional stage. And so what's familiar with, for people is standard login credentials, an aspect of being able to do password recovery, quick access to their account using a PIN, um, those combined, and also backups, making sure the data is automatically backed up because in the cloud-based world we're in, we log into websites. It's not like if we lose our, our laptop or our phone that we can't log into that website again. But believe it or not, there's many blockchain apps which are run are, are downloaded through a website. But if you lose or even uninstall your browser, you've actually lost access to the keys for that blockchain app. And no user is going to accept that. They're going to go, what? What the hell? And so we provide that familiar experience. Log into this application or log into a new device because you lost your first, uh, answer these recovery questions because you forgot your password, enter a PIN to log in on the device you've logged into before for faster logins, Um, two-factor authentication, we can do device locking very very easily inside of this SDK so people that might have access to your password still can't access your data. You combine all of that 
revision control as well. You corrupted your data, we can roll it back. All of that is built into our platform, and we've bundled that up in a very simple SDK that other app developers can use, and they don't have to deal with the, the big pool of technologies that, although have been available, haven't been easy to develop on. We've bundled that all up for them. Now, it seemed like you were mainly talking about software type applications, but what about the whole other part of hardware? I mean, we had the Clipper chip. What about the hardware side of stuff? How do we know that we're dealing with trusted execution environments or things of that nature when we're managing the generation and creation of these and storage of these uh, private keys? I think in the end, it's a turtles all the way down problem is that we're, we're going to have to trust something and we're going to have to trust somebody. It's just trying to eliminate that as much as possible. And my fundamental belief is that in the end, we are not going to be holding separate hardware devices in addition to the, the general computation devices that we already own. Instead, those devices are going to become smarter and they're going to be mo- become more hardened. And that's already happening with our devices where we're actually getting trusted ex- execution environments on there, or at least secure storage. Secure encrypted storage that can only be unlocked with a very, very rate-limited pin or, or fingerprint a blocker. Could, could you give an actually, example of that? I mean, what do you mean we already have these trusted execution environments? Easy example, the iPhone. As of iPhone 5S, we have what's called the Secure Enclave, which allows an application to put data into a portion of the phone that is encrypted and uncrackable without having without opening the chip and therefore destroying the device. And this is part of what Apple and the DOJ have been wrangling over. The, what they were wrangling over was actually a phone that was developed prior to the hardware Secure Enclave that Apple now has. So in effect, that was just simply software encryption, which, you know, given a fairly simple pin, the DOJ could have broken pretty easily, and I'm assuming that they effectively did. But with Apple's now implementation of a hardware level of security, that's effectively just about near unbreakable. Now, the person that they were going after, the phone they were going after, just happened to be one generation early. Hence the reason they were able, able to get into it. With the later forms of hardware, uh, anything with a Touch ID sensor on an iPhone actually now supports a hardware level of encryption that's just about near unbreakable. And so now Android devices are starting to get this type of technology and they're becoming more prevalent. So this is what I mean by us having uh, more secure and almost hardware wallet caliber de- devices in our hands without having to buy another device. What about the, you mentioned this, the touch sensor with the iPhone. What are kind of your thoughts on that? Is that really secure? I mean, we, we saw, what was it, Minority Report, where they took the eyeballs out yep. and put it in the sack, right? Uh, can't someone just kind of take your thumb, or if they've got you, they've got your private key? Is that a problem with I mean, biometrics? Uh, like I say, you could have like a $500 hardware wallet, but then a $5 pair of pliers, you know, cranked on your finger and your pinky, and you'll probably give up whatever they need to, to go ahead and get your private key. So it's really... You know, what are the attack vectors? There's no such thing as perfect security. There's no such thing as linearly increasing security. It's just what are the attack vectors and what do you want to protect against? And so if you're trying to protect against outside attackers that don't have access to your device, then local encryption, making sure that nothing gets sent onto the network that's that's unencrypted, that does a pretty damn good job. And one of the fundamental concepts of edge security is not just that we're going to try to be absolutely bulletproof, super encrypted, blah, blah, blah. It's the fact that if you don't know where the value is and the value is distributed across millions of people around the world and and you've given them a high-powered vault that's in their pocket, now an attacker isn't really motivated to attack the system because they have to attack every person and every device one by one, not even knowing how much value is in each of those devices, whether it be just digital data or private keys. And now you've created security not just by technology, you've created security by game theory. And that's a very powerful thing. And the beauty is Bitcoin and the blockchain has motivated this exact model. Yeah, so that's a very interesting argument. Uh, you, you, By decentralizing everything, including the private keys and the records themselves, that you reduce the economies of scale for the hackers. And so yep. they're the probability that they're going to be able to generate a return on investment from their hacking decreases because they aren't able to get 50 million records all at once. I mean, is that kind of the the, that's, the that's assertion huge, there? That is the assertion. And the nice thing is there's always going to be some centralized systems that, hold, that will hold some aspect of data. Those become the much, much bigger target. The easier target with a bigger reward. And so... You're, you're not the slowest gazelle, which is really, really nice. But you're right. That's exactly the assertion. Is it's, it's harder to hack, and there's less of a reward from the hacking attempt. And you just don't know what the value is. You just simply don't know. And so that's a powerful thing to have. And I think that's what Bitcoin is motivated, right? It's like decentralized value. Let all of us hold it in the sense that don't put it in a bank. 
in the same sense, let's put our data not in a data bank. Let's hold it ourselves. So how are we going to see the Airbit's wallet evolve over time? I think what we're going to see is the Airbit's wallet will be your authenticating app that, to authenticate into multiple blockchain or usually non-blockchain applications that, that provide edge security for their users. So we're close to announcing a partnership with you know, one of the larger blockchain applications in that they'll be using Airbit's edge security. So you'll be able to cross-authenticate with the same credentials into this app versus your Airbit's app. And so our goal is to make Airbit basically the single sign-on solution across blockchain and edge secure apps. The same way that Google and Facebook are you know, trying to become the single sign-on across web applications, we can do that, but across blockchain applications because it's a zero trust model. Whereas with Google and Facebook login, you are 100% trusting Google and Facebook and any of their employees to not log in as you onto a Google and Facebook supporting site. With Airbit, that's not the case. Only you can log into those applications um, and I think that's what I'm, we're really excited about is this ecosystem play where we power these applications, but in the same sense, we're not just powering them, we're actually driving an ecosystem by which people with, with a simple set of credentials can log into all of, these, uh, all of these apps, and they can now have one set of really, really good credentials. It's impossible for us to remember 20, 30 uh, usernames, passwords, or, or private key mnemonics and passphrases, but we can easily remember one to three really, really good ones. So it's taking the LastPass model and applying it to blockchain applications and supporting them in a very native way that they need. Man, that's fascinating. So you've been the organizer of the San Diego Bitcoin meetup for years now, and there have been some odd ducks that have come out of the San Diego Bitcoin community. Maybe you've got a war story that you'd like to tell just from your time in Bitcoin. Like, what's kind of one of the one like of the a, war stories? Something that's uh, you know just from oh, interacting man. with so so many people in the space and helping people learn about Bitcoin and all this stuff. Do you got any particular war story you might want to? That's the kind of thing you got to give me a heads up on because I had. You're right. There have been so many interactions, but I can't. In, I, I feel like even the war stories have have come out with as, as positive interactions in the end. I mean, there's some really odd ducks, but. I'll end up getting some pretty fascinating insights from people. And as you probably know, our entire uh, co-founding team was actually built out of meeting people at the meetups. And actually, one of our co-founders and, and, and investors was actually someone that I had met flying in a plane with you, Trace, you know, going over to uh, one of the first conferences I'd been to in the Bitcoin space. And so it was, I would call them less any war stories. They're definitely odd interactions, no question about it. Well, just just um, uh, interacting with people in the Bitcoin space. Mm -hmm, yeah. I mean, have you, I don't know, anybody remember, dying in ditch or... I no one, no one died in ditch. There was one person that I remember interacting with that, you know, a lot of people in the Bitcoin space care about privacy. This guy took it to a whole nother extreme. He brought around his own little like 3G access point that had built-in Tor. And he wouldn't connect to anything without that. He would never RSVP to any of the meetups. He would just kind of show up. He only gave his first name. And no one it knew... It probably was... wasn't his first name. And it probably wasn't his first name either, exactly. No one knew his contact information. And, and when he would say something, oh, that sounds interesting, you know, yeah, I'll touch base with that later, you wouldn't really know what the hell later meant. You just kind of have to come to the next meetup and hope that he'd show up. <laughs> and, and he'd show up to maybe one out of four meetups, and I haven't seen him in like a couple of years. Um, and this is back when there were maybe five people showing up to the meetup. Oh, and, interesting. And people would tell me about this guy. Oh, you got to meet this guy. Oh, you got to meet this guy. And I, think I, I showed up to one, and he finally came out. You know, so it was interesting to meet him. And it, it kind of makes you a little more enlightened as to what's available and what's usable. And you realize you know, the stuff he's doing is barely usable. But it's out there. We can protect ourselves. And what inspires me is I like knowing the technology available, but then try to find ways of hiding it. Enable it in everybody. So things like you know running Tor, can that just be enabled by default underneath the application where people don't even have to know that it's, it's happening? That's the kind of technology that excites me, to, to create zero knowledge where people don't even know it's zero knowledge. Like Apple enabling uh, full encryption on iMessage, and people don't even know it's there. My wife doesn't care. She it just, she just gets it. That's what I'm excited about. So we've we've seen Tor. I mean, how 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 about like Bitcoin Core and Airbits? Maybe you can speak a little bit to uh, the Tor usage there. So Airbits doesn't natively support Tor. So people would have to run Tor on a on a router, or they'd have to run it on like on Android, running through VPN and whatnot. So we don't natively support it. It's definitely a, a good amount of extra work, and there's a lot of low hanging fruit that we've got to work on first. Um, Bitcoin Core, you can operate with Tor. Um, 
I haven't personally run it with, with Tor myself because I just simply don't run a full Bitcoin core node. At Airbits, we support an alternative implementation of, of Bitcoin called LibBitcoin. It was much more modular, which is what we loved about it. Bitcoin Core is, for the most part, monolithic, really hard to build other applications using the source code. But LibBitcoin being very modular it was suited really well. Challenging thing is there's you know, not as much development on it. The main core developers of Bitcoin Core working on it. But in a way, we are the core developers of that, that protocol, especially Eric from Seattle has done a lot of great work on it. So we hope to, to contribute more into that, that source base. So what are you most optimistic about Bitcoin? Optimistic about Bitcoin. I think what we're finding is there's definitely significant use cases that, um, I mean, there's the blockchain. We're here at a very blockchain-focused conference, and I'm excited about that. But I do think that some of, some of those projects, especially the ones that are hopping on the smart contract, Ethereum, Rootstock type of project, I think those are a bit of ways out. Uh, some are close to, to production, but most are quite a bit of ways out. I think, you know, fundamentally, I do think Bitcoin in and of itself is a killer app. And what I'm excited about is there are pockets of demographics and small circles that are finding true value in it. It's starting off with the gray market as well as remit. So there's some clear markets and there's some gray markets, but there's true value in that and that area is growing. And so that is, I think, what is pretty exciting is it's not just a toy anymore. There are people in this world that actually can, will, and need to use it. We've had a wonderful interview with Paul Pewey, CEO of Airbits. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks a lot, Trace. Take care. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin Guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise, spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate. <laughs>